communication policy at the, at the Heartland Institute. Okay. And Troy, we haven't really met, but I'm, a, I'm literally an organizer for the Chicago Teachers Union. And I love Karen Lewis, and I am, I'm a child of the public schools in Chicago. He's a principal. Entertaining public or private education is that basically, basically. Well, I'm actually a child of both. I went to LaSalle School until we learned that I would have to go to Cooley High for high school, and my mother said, I'm not moving to the fucking suburb. Sorry, young man. Uh, and I went to lab school. Have at it. I'm supposed to go for 10 minutes, and then you, and then we go back and forth? Correct. Okay. Just walked two miles in the heat to get here. That was not a smart decision. Um, it's my understanding that we're here to debate the merits of spending public taxpayer dollars to fund private education, whether it be in the form of privately managed charter schools or traditional private schools, as a method for improving educational outcomes for our students. Now, when they asked me here and they told me I'd be debating uh, the senior, I'm a, I'm a principal, they told me I'd be debating the senior fellow of the Heartland Institute, a conservative think tank. I thought, who do they think I am? Um, so I have to say a little something about my perspective, because there's some things that people may not know. Uh, number one, uh, yes, I was a public school student, public school teacher, public school assistant principal, and public school principal. But there was a time when I was spending $15,000 per year to put my son through private school. I no longer do that because I realized that he could get a better education in a public school, but there was a time. I was once a private school principal. I was once a turnaround school assistant principal, meaning I went in, fired the entire staff, and got a new one. I once put two, not one, but two proposals in to create charter schools. Most people don't know that about me. And I was once a finalist for principal position at a charter school. And so I have a demonstrated history of my, in my life of not being on one on some ideological position, on some ideological divide where I don't listen to reason. I have a demonstrated history of being willing to try different ideas on both ends of the ideological spectrum. But at some point, evidence begins to pile up. And you begin to see that something's not quite right here. And so I'm here to talk about some of the evidence that has presented itself to us and to me that people seem to be ignoring. Before I do that, I want to talk about the ethical use of evidence and data. Because all too often, we have people on one or the other side of the issue quoting facts in a manner that is unscientific and reckless. And I want to be scientific and responsible with how we look at data. Here's an example of unscientific and reckless use of data. I have two third grade teachers. One of them is on a, in a high income community. She gets a classroom full of students who are reading at the fifth grade level. Another is in a low income community and she gets a classroom full of students who are reading at a first grade level. At the end of the year, with both of these teachers, the, high, the kids in the high income community are still at a fifth grade level. They have not grown, so they'll be going into fourth grade at a fifth grade level. Still a year ahead. At the end of the year, the students in the low income community have gained two years worth of growth and they are now at a third grade level going into the fourth grade. But they're still a year behind. Who's the more effective teacher? What will the test scores show? If we just cite, oh, this teacher has kids that are a year ahead, right? That is an unethical use of data. It does not take into, it is not scientific in that it does not take into account another factor that influenced the scores, which is the beginning point that the students were at. Am I making sense here? Yeah. 
And so, there is a mountain of data that says that this theory about choice in schools is backward and it is decreasing the quality of education that students get in our schools. I will today discuss one strand of it, just due to lack of time, because if I had more, I'd talk all night and all afternoon. It's called the measure of academic progress. And it takes into account a student's starting point. And so students took the exam in spring of 2013. And they took the exam again in spring of 2014. And they measured how much students learned between exams in that year. That's how Chicago public school teachers are evaluated, by the measure of academic progress, because it takes into account student starting point. Now, if you can evaluate a teacher based on the growth of her students using this assessment, then you can evaluate a school or, or look at the effective, get a sense of the effectiveness of a school by looking at the growth of all the students in the school. And if you can do that, then you can take the growth of all of the Chicago public school students and then the growth of all of the Chicago charter school students, choice stu the students whose parents chose to put them in those schools. You can take that growth and compare them side to side. And if the schools that the parents chose to put their children in have higher growth, then Mr. Barron is right and I can step off the stage, charters for everyone. If the students in those stu charter schools where parents chose to put their children do not grow more so than students in the public sector, then the theory of choice does not work. And if the students grow far less than the students in public school, then the theory of choice has just destroyed education for thousands of students across our city. So what happened? They report the results, actually they didn't report the results. They reported them by school, but they didn't do the charter public comparison. I had to do that myself. And when I got the results, I realized why I had to do it myself. They report the results in percentile ranks. So if you're in the 99th percentile, you're one of the best schools in the nation, not just Chicago, the nation, in terms of the growth the impact you have on student performance. If you're in the first percentile, you are among the lowest performing in the nation in terms of the impact you have on student performance. Here are the results. And I did these myself, then I gave them to a Chicago public school psychometrician who validated them, then I sent them to the Chicago Sun-Times where their data specialist, Art Golab, independently evaluated them and wrote an article. And if I remember the article, it's titled uh, Chicago neighbor, CPS neighborhood schools outpace charters in student growth, especially in reading. So here are the results. CPS public selective enrollment schools, 99th percentile. CPS public magnet schools, 83rd percentile. CPS public neighborhood schools, 75th percentile. CPS charter schools, 48th percentile. Now, it doesn't stop there. If you rank the schools from the lowest performing in terms of growth to the highest, and then you look at the midpoint, 90% of charter schools are below, are in the bottom half of performance. Nine out of every 10 charter schools is in the bottom half of performance in terms of the growth they foster in students in reading. What kind of model for schooling are we creating where nine out of 10 of every new school you create can't even beat the average of the schools that are in existence already? And it is important to note that parents chose to put their children in those schools. One of the most insidious things about it is that increasingly white and Asian students who are at the top of the achievement gap are in public schools. And increasingly black and Latino students are in charters and they're at the bottom of the achievement gap. We all know about the achievement gap, right? And so if white and Asian students who are at the top of the achievement gap are increasingly in public schools that foster the most growth, 
and the students at the bottom of the achievement gap are being funneled to schools that foster the least growth, what's going to happen? The achievement gap widens. And indeed, about a year and a half ago, there was a report that the achievement gap in Chicago has indeed widened and choice is responsible for the widening of that achievement gap. Now I've talked about the wide angle of it. In my next series of remarks, I'm going to go in and look at individual schools and neighborhoods where choices were made. But before I do that, I want to give you guys an opportunity to hear Mr. Barrett um, talk about his perspective on school choice. And maybe I can get a sense of something I don't understand uh, in terms of why people continue to advocate for a system that appears to be failing. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I do not have access to that data, and I did read some of those articles. And if everything that Troy says is true, then definitely I would, you should, everyone should question what's going on with the system. Clearly, this is not just about charter schools or whether charter schools are draining students or things like that. I actually come at this from an entirely different perspective. Uh, a, a, what I'll call it a broader one. Um, and we could, uh, Troy's right, we could debate data, we could have experts on both sides sit there and parse through test scores, and here's what we'll find out. Some charters are very good, some charters are average, some charters are not good and should be closed, some public schools are bad, but interestingly enough, there's still a waiting list to get into charters. And there's still a, more and more people wanting to create charters, so if Troy is right, maybe we should start questioning that and look at it. But I want to do this, I want to question something else. Because if everything is so rosy, then why is Chicago public schools only graduating 62% uh, 60, uh, of its students? Why is the system doing so poorly with all the money that it's getting? Let him talk. Okay, so everybody has our opinion on that. Here's the deal. This debate isn't really so much about public or private. I think this debate is about centralization versus decentralization. And I think what we need to have is a discussion on what does the parent want? What is best for each child? And I think it's time we start questioning large urban districts, which on paper and in test scores and by parental choice are being called into question all across this country. And they're not doing the right the service for their students uh, and, and the citizens if they're expensive, if they're failing so many people, and if they're not working. So really quickly, Here's a couple of things that are going on in the world. There's a charter school in uh, Arizona called Carpe Diem, and it has an interesting thing with uh, it has an interesting thing with affective software, and they, it takes kids through the process of learning much faster than uh, elsewhere uh, in their uh, the people that are comp competing with them. Then we also have um, an Ethiopian village where they dropped off tablet computers that had nothing on them but software and they came back three months later and the kids in this village with almost no electricity and no school by the way that taught themselves to read from this software. We live in a day and age where this cell phone or a tablet computer can give us the sum of human knowledge delivered to our phone and we're in a situation now where everybody in this audience can be simultaneously be a student and a teacher and learn in a lifelong fashion and I ask you this with all of that stuff that we have at our disposal right now why are we defending a top-down one-size-fits-all giant bureaucracy when everything that Troy can do with his schools and every talent that he has as a good principal and a good teacher can come out and produce better students faster than any top-down system can is he a better principal than some of the others out there? Should he be running Chicago schools instead of Arnie Duncan or, uh, or Mr. Ruiz? Yeah, absolutely he should. But what I want you to all take a look at and take a step back from is why are we defending a 19th century model that if it's working for some, certainly isn't working for all. And Troy is probably one of the better examples. And there's hundreds of good people in the system. But let's look at some numbers. $13,000 per year per student. If I gave you 10 students at $130,000 and I said, here's what you should teach them this year, how many people in this audience could do a good job with those students? 
Instead, we funnel it through CPS, and we funnel it through all of the special interests, all of the contractors, all of the unions, everything else. They all get their first bite at the apple before the, the, the student is even thought of. So this is a much, much broader than whether some charter schools are bad or whether some test scores are and aren't working. This is about creating the kind of education system that works for everybody. Do we want more parental involvement? Instead of creating a giant pre-K bureaucracy, why don't we just pay parents who can deliver their students ready to learn on the first day of kindergarten, why don't we just pay those parents $1,000? Let's try that as a pilot program. That costs $33 million, which is at one-tenth of one of the contracts that Troy pointed out that, that, that Rahm Emanuel was doing. So I want you to stop and think about this a minute, and I want you to question some of these things. Is choice the problem? No, I don't think it is. Is choice the only answer? Is it a panacea? To Troy's point, I don't think choice is the only answer either. What I want you to do is start questioning again and again and again why all of these positive things can't happen in a much more independent system where a teacher could get together with another teacher and start a small school. Where, uh, where citizens can get together. Here in Chicago, we have something amazing called local school councils. It's actually a, a model by which we can not only free up district schools and have them become true neighborhood schools run by the neighborhood, but more and more parents could maybe get together and start more schools. Continuous process of decentralization. And the reason I'm a proponent of choice is not because of test scores or common core or to make little black children as good as little white children in Lake Forest and places like that. It's to break up the system so that what can work for some can start working for everybody and the model gets better. So please, everybody, start questioning that. I want you to start asking yourself, do, do, should teachers get paid more? Yeah, probably. Do they have to get paid along a step and lane change system negotiated by a union? I don't think so. I'm, I don't think that's the best model to pay teachers. Um, should we question a big, large urban district? Or can we break that up? Uh, even, into, even make every school much more independent and let the talented principals run the schools the way they should be run. These are all the things we gotta start talking about. More tutoring available, more parental involvement, more ways to get the parents involved in the child's education, particularly in a district that's 45% black, uh, if 40% black and 45% Hispanic, where, everybody, where so many of the white and Asian students have actually left the system. So this isn't just about choice and charters and whether charters are good or bad. This is about whether in today's technological age, we can devise an entirely new and open source system where the money follows the child to a vast new array of education resources and, and capabilities. Thank you. There is a demand, you mentioned demand for, for charters. There is a demand for heroin, crack, and fast food, but that doesn't make them good for you. What? <laughs> kind of. Now, I mentioned that I'd look at specific schools in terms of looking at the effect of choice on a smaller level. I have a little data here on my, my phone. Hopefully I won't get a phone call while I'm doing this. <laughs> so let's take a look at individual neighborhoods and choices that were made in these individual neighborhoods. So first we'll take a look at West Pullman and Oak Hill Gardens, where there are three charter schools and about a dozen public schools. Now, the three charter schools are CICS, Prairie, Hawkins, and Lloyd Barn. Some of the public schools are Higgins, Brown, and Du Bois. The percentile rank of Higgins is the 99th. The percentile rank of Brown is the 99th. The percentile rank of Du Bois, in terms of how they foster student growth, is the 80th. The percentile rank of the charters that the parents in that community took their children out of Higgins, Brown, and Du Bois and put their children into CICS Prairie, the sixth percentile. CICS Hawkins, the third percentile. CICS Lloyd Barnes, the first percentile. They took their children out. They made the choice 
to take their children out of schools where their children were learning and put their children into schools that higher, had higher performing kids but who didn't, who, schools who didn't seem to be able to impact student learning once the students were enrolled in the school. Let's take a look at Chatham where we have Shabazz. Some of the public schools, Shabazz is the charter school. Some of the public schools there are Brownell, 97th percentile. Dixon, 77th percentile. Park Manor, 67th percentile. Can anybody guess? the percentile rank and reading of Shabazz. I, I, I'll give you a hint, you can do it with one finger. So parents took their children out, made the choice, the uninformed choice, of taking their children out of schools that were fostering more growth by far than any charter school around and put them in the school where their children learned little to nothing. But they got to be around other kids who were about as smart as they were. Bronzeville. They have Bronzeville Lighthouse. That's the charter. Doolittle is at the 99th percentile. Wells is at the 78th percentile. Bronzeville Lighthouse, where parents took their children out of the public schools that were getting that, that tremendous growth, is at the second percentile. And so the theory that parent choice, parent choice will drive up the performance of the system has failed. You know, they call it the parent trigger. And I actually think that's an apt metaphor. Because when I think of a trigger, I think of guns. I think of parents who I've heard in the news media who, who make the choice to buy a gun to protect their household and their children. But I never hear a news story about a parent who used that gun to protect their children. All too often what happens so tragically is that that gun ends up wounding the children through some mishap or another. And it seems that something similar has happened when we took the trigger of choice and put it in the hands of parents on the south and west sides and, all the, and even on the north side. That the parents with the best interests of their children in mind have picked up that trigger, made that choice. And inadvertently and tragically wounded their own children in the process. How many failed schools, charter schools, do we have to have? How many more reports from Northwestern University and the University of Chicago and that data do we have to have before we decide that the choice theory has failed us? Now, choice is cool, but choice isn't my goal for education. My goal is excellence. If choice is your thing, even if choice is your thing, you have to agree that it is not the job of government to promote a model of schooling that produces systematically poor choices for parents to choose from. And that's what's happened in Chicago. It must stop. It is time to bury the choice movement and move on with evidence-based practices that have been shown to work for our children. I hope during the question and answer session we get to discuss some of those practices, but choice is not one of them. Thank you. So, decades, eons, centuries of economic theory, uh, centuries of practice, indicate that it's all wrong because if you change the measurement from one kind of test score to a specific kind of student growth and then look at the data and move it across the lines and say the data actually does this and actually does that, it means that every parent in the city of Chicago who wants to have a charter school or maybe wants to have a voucher or something to go to an entirely different kind of school, they're all wrong. That why, why CPS knows best. Not, not the mayoral run Rahm Emanuel CPS, which incidentally, during the time that these improvements happened, might have happened partially on his watch. So we can either criticize him for being corrupt and doing money laundering with, uh, with some of the stuff that he's doing with uh, contracts, or we can say, well, some of these benefits, some of these things that have improved in the city of Chicago over the last few years might have had something to do with some of the reforms started by Daley and continued by Emanuel. But that, again, that's not the issue. The issue is all of these things that parents might want, 
All of these different kinds of things are wrong. All because we've taken the data and looked at it a slightly different way and proved that all the newspapers, all the studies, everything that's come before, everything that's been in the headlines, everything that we've looked at with the dropout rates, all of it is wrong because the district, because the district actually works and, it, and it, it's not capable of making mistakes. Folks, I would ask you to really question that. I do not have the command of all of the facts and figures and, and things that, uh, that, yeah, because I have on, on my side, I have something that's, e yeah, because what's even better, what's even better, I'm not ignoring anything, sir. Here's, what, here's what's more important. What do the parents want and what works for them? What works for their child? And I would like to have Troy go into those schools where they have chosen charters and then also take all the data apart and really look at it because I've seen the use of the Northwestern data and the Credo study saying that 37% of this and we compare all charter schools to all public schools and, the, and this, that, and the other thing. And the fact of the matter is when you really look at it, the charters are working. Are they perfect? Are they a panacea? No, they're not. Some public schools, some, uh, some district schools here are working, but I want to end with this. I want you to actually think about this. Because Troy has done a great job on his website of discussing all of the things that are going on in, in CPS with the way that they're playing around with money. And that would be something he and I have a great deal of agreement on in transparency of, what, of how the budget is spent. But think about this. Think of one hand hold a vote. You can vote for a mayor, you can vote for your alderman, and think about that vote. Okay? And think about what that vote, what, is, what impact is that going to have on school policy? What impact is that going to have on teachers' negotiation powers uh, out of Springfield and out of the City Hall? What is that going to have for your ability to actually control your child's education? That vote will, exactly, sir, none. Now, think about this. Now hold in your hand a seven to ten or eight thousand dollar education savings account that you can use at the school of your choice in a much more dynamic and open system instead of only a public or private system, but where all the schools are essentially public because it's public money, and all the schools are essentially independent because they're not run by a top-down, corrupt, money-laundering district. And you ask yourself, you have that vote in your hand, you have that vote in your hand, or you have that seven to $10,000 in your hand, and you tell me which one empowers parents more to choose the education for their child. Thank you. Yeah.